Good morning and welcome to Tuesday of Holy Week. Uh, this week we are looking at um, the speech that Stephen gives after he is falsely accused of insulting Moses and insulting God and speaking against the temple and against the law. He gives this really long speech before he's stoned to death and um, yesterday we looked at the early uh, the first part of that speech where he talks about the early history of Israel from Abraham to Joseph. Today, we are going to look at the second part of that speech uh, where he talks about Moses. Please listen to him for the word of the Lord. When it was time for God to keep the promise he made to Abraham, the number of our people in Egypt had greatly expanded. But then another king rose to power over Egypt who didn't know anything about Joseph. He exploited our people and abused our ancestors. He even forced them to abandon their newly born babies so they would die. That's when Moses was born. He was highly favored by God and for three months his parents cared for him in their home. After he was abandoned, Pharaoh's daughter adopted and cared for him as though he were her own son. Moses learned everything Egyptian wisdom had to offer and he was a man of powerful words and deeds. When Moses was 40 years old, he decided to visit his family, the Israelites. He saw one of them being wronged, so he came to his rescue and evened the score by killing the Egyptian. He expected his own kin to understand that God was using him to rescue them, but they didn't. The next day, he came upon some Israelites who were caught up in an argument. He tried to make peace between them, saying, you are brothers, why are you harming each other? The one who started the fight against his neighbor pushed Moses aside and said, who appointed you as our leader and judge? Are you planning to kill me like you killed that Egyptian yesterday? When Moses heard this, he fled to Midian, where he lived as an immigrant and had two sons. Forty years later, an angel appeared to Moses in the flame of a burning bush in the wilderness near Mount Sinai. Enthralled by the sight, Moses approached to get a closer look, and he heard the Lord's voice. I am the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Trembling with fear, Moses didn't dare to investigate any further, but the Lord continued, Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. I have clearly seen the oppression my people have experienced in Egypt, and I have heard their groaning. I have come down to rescue them. Come, I am sending you to Egypt. This is the same Moses whom they rejected when they asked, who appointed you as our leader and judge. This is the Moses whom God sent as leader and deliverer. God did this with the help of the angel who appeared before him in the bush. This man led them out after he performed wonders and signs in Egypt at the Red Sea and for 40 years in the wilderness. This is the Moses who told the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your own people. This is the one who was in the assembly in the wilderness with our ancestors and with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai. He is the one who received life-giving words to give to us. He's also the one whom our ancestors refused to obey. Instead, they pushed him aside, and in their thoughts and desires returned to Egypt. They told Aaron, make us gods that will lead us. As for this Moses who led us out of Egypt, we don't know what's happened to him. That's when they made an idol in the shape of a calf, offered a sacrifice to it, and began to celebrate what they had made with their own hands. So God turned away from them and had them over to worship the stars in the sky, just as it is written in the scroll of the prophets, did you bring sacrifices and offerings to me for 40 years in the wilderness house of Israel? No, instead you took the tent of Moloch with you and the star of your God Raphan, the images that you made in order to worship them. Therefore, I will send you far away, farther than Babylon. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Stephen quoting Amos there uh, at the end of his speech. Now you'll notice that Stephen doesn't directly address the accusations made against him. Instead, he recites the history of Israel. Not really the most effective way to defend against the charges. Now, in the last couple of chapters leading up to this in Acts, we see a deepening of a rift within the Jewish community. It's important to remember the followers of Jesus were Jews. Remember, Peter and John were in the temple every day. Stephen went to the synagogue to share the message of Jesus. The followers of Jesus were trying to convince their Jewish brothers and sisters that Jesus was the awaited Messiah. And at this point in the narrative of Acts, the Jesus movement is still a part of Judaism, just like the Pharisees or the Sadducees or the Zealots. 
And when it comes to Jesus, many thousands, we're told, believed that Jesus was the Messiah. But there were many others, especially those in power, who didn't. And so these two groups are struggling with each other for the hearts and the minds of the people. And, and Stephen and Peter and John are trying to convince the people that the rightful leadership of Israel is the apostles, not the Sanhedrin. But it's also important to remember that the people reading and hearing this, well, for them, that time is long gone. And this division has hardened into bitterness and hatred and outright persecution. So in the narrative, Stephen's words are addressed to his accuser, but the true audience of the speech, the ones to whom Luke is writing in the book of Acts, are followers of Jesus, both Jew and Gentile, who were living at a later time persecuted by both the Jewish people and Rome. So Stephen's speech is also addressed to them and is meant to assure them that the charges of blasphemy, blasphemy that have made, been made against them are not true. And the reason that this is important is that if we think of Stephen as Christian when he gives this speech, then the speech sounds very anti-Semitic. It comes off sounding like, well, the Jews missed the boat and got it wrong and Christians are the ones who got it right. But if we remember that he is speaking as a Jew, trying to convince other Jews his brothers and sisters, that Jesus was the promised Messiah, it's easy to understand his words. And if we remember that the audience is not the Sanhedrin, but those Christians living decades later when this was written, to assure them that they are indeed God's people, then it's also easier to understand. For both groups, Stephen is making the argument that the story of Israel always pointed to the coming of Jesus and that Israel's story now continues in Christ and those that follow him, not in following the Sanhedrin and sticking to the old ways of following the law. He starts out his speech by pointing out, as Sarah noticed, noted yesterday, that there's a lot of movement in the early days of Israel, and God was always with them. So he's making the point that God is not bound to a particular place, say the temple, for instance. And now in the second section, he moves to talk about Moses, and he speaks lovingly of Moses, just in case anyone believes that he insulted Moses. But he, he describes the rejection of Moses by his own people. He describes Moses as God's chosen leader and deliverer, but says that his people kept rejecting them. He says it was this Moses whom they rejected, drawing attention to Moses as if to say, this Moses, the one whom God had chosen to deliver Israel, this is the Moses that our ancestors rejected, and that resulted in idolatry and even exile. It, it, it's like Stephen is saying to the Sanhedrin, please, let's not make this mistake again. Please, brothers and sisters, don't you make the same mistake that our ancestors made in rejecting the deliverer that God sent. And to those who were hearing this speech decades later, he's saying, rejoice and be glad because you didn't make the same mistake that our ancestors made. You know, as I read the first two parts of this speech, it, it seems to me I just hear Stephen, what, what he's really saying is, be open to the Holy Spirit, brothers and sisters. I know Jesus isn't what you expected. I know he's not who you expected, but he's the real deal. He's God's chosen deliverer. Don't make the mistake of rejecting him. Stop thinking that you've got God all figured out. Stop making religion about following the rules. Instead, let God be God. Open your eyes and your heart and your mind to what God is doing and where God is moving in the world and follow him. And you know, I think that's a good message for American Christians to hear today. Theologian Marcus Borg wrote that the dominant paradigm of Judaism is holiness, being set apart, being pure, being perfect, following the rules. But then Jesus came along and he encouraged people to understand God through the framework of compassion. Look at what he writes. He says, compassion, not Holiness is the dominant quality of God and is, therefore, to be the ethos of the community that mirrors God. I think that's what Stephen is saying. 
I think that's what Stephen is getting at. He is speaking to people who were focused on holiness, whereas he and the other followers of Jesus were focused on compassion, and he was begging them to follow suit. Now, there's nothing wrong with holiness, but when it's the dominant paradigm through which we view God, then, then we emphasize what sets us apart, what separates us from the unfaithful, from the unbelievers. The community whose dominant paradigm is holiness spends their time focusing on who's right and who's wrong, who's in and who's out, who is living the way God wants and who isn't, arguing with other people within their community about who's best at following the rules and condemning those outside their community who don't. But Jesus, well, he associated with those who didn't follow the rules, those who were considered unclean, unholy, the untouchable of his time. Because Jesus understood that God is a God of compassion. And Jesus was moved by a vision of compassion. And his followers are called to do the same. To follow Jesus means to understand that God is a God of compassion who is anxious to embrace those who are hurting and broken and in need of reconciliation and love. And it's good for us to remember that it was only because his followers dared to embrace Jesus' vision of compassion that they dared to extend the love of God to the most untouchable of all the groups, the Gentiles. Thank God they did. If they hadn't, well, then this week would be just another week to you and me. Let us pray. Gracious God, help us be people of compassion who have a vision of compassion and live that out in the world. We make this prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.